Bienvenidos, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Office Hours. I suppose that's uh, Horas de la Oficina, uh, where I answer your SQL Server questions. Today I'm coming to you from Cabo San Lucas, Mexico. Uh, now, I, I'm really encouraged by the bandwidth down at my new condo that I think I might be able to stream. Latency is kind of hit or miss. It's like 100 to 150 milliseconds. But the upload speed is high enough that I think I'm going to be able to do uh, streaming broadcasts from down here. So we'll find out later this week. Uh, in the meantime, before I go down and go get in the pool, this is going to be the first time that I've ever gotten in that pool, I think. Uh, uh, let's go answer some of your questions. Okay, so first up, the highest voted question from PollGab. MD asks, Hi Brent, as SQL Server works with AK pages, why is the recommended MTFS allocation unit size for SQL for Server volumes 64K? Wouldn't 8K be more a more efficient fit? Rarely, the pro, rarely though, do you ever ask for just one 8K page. Usually you ask for several 8K pages at a time. And it just so happens that SQL Server stores objects in groups of eight 8K pages. It's called an extent. E-X-T-E-N-T. -E uh, so that's why usually SQL Server will ask for 64K or even larger at a time. That's why the 64K allocation came about. MD follows up with, uh, I'm sneaking in a second question. No, actually, <laughs> you're not. Second up, uh, Ratbert asks, Hi Brent, is there a good way to be notified when a new table is created in production? I would like to know when a new table is created by anyone in production. What you're looking for is called a DDL trigger. If you search for DDL trigger, and beyond that, if you search for DDL trigger Kendra Little GitHub, I want to say that Kendra Little has written a DDL trigger for this exact purpose, and I think it's in a GitHub gist on her uh, GitHub account. Uh, but if you search for DDL trigger create table, you'll find a lot of examples out there. The one thing that I would caution you with about uh, is make sure that your trigger can't fail. I, I've seen examples where people do things like add an entry to a logging table and they don't think too deeply about it, but unfortunately the name of the object that gets created somehow bro breaks their logging mechanism, like they weren't prepared for uh, tables with unusual names or something like that. And it ended up that their DDL trigger interfered with someone else's op uh, operation, broke their rollout script, and you don't want to be involved in the pin the blame on, pin the, blame on the donkey thing. Uh, so, but check DDL trigger and use a well-rehearsed one. Next up, Dogbert says, "Do you, hi Brent, do you foresee much commercial opportunity for someone creating Postgres training classes similar to what you do with SQL Server training? I do, but there's this thing. The cheaper something is, the less that people are willing to pay for stuff related to it. If you have a Ferrari, you're willing to bust out a huge wallet and spend all kinds of money in order to get that Ferrari repaired, and there are generally only a few people who do a good job of repairing that Ferrari. If you have a Chevy, you are much less concerned about that, and you are more likely to go to a corner mechanic, just someone cheap, in order to get the job done quickly. So the price premium on Postgres training may not be as high as the, post, the, the price premium, premium on SQL Server training. So, but I, I think it's out there. It just may not, uh, you may not be able to afford a, a condo in Mexico. Skunkbert asks, hi Brent, when will you stream your awful playing skills in Dead by Daylight? Um, yesterday was the first time that I actually played down here. I had to get the computer set up, get the, you know, the monitor and all that kind of thing going. I play on, a, on my monitor in my living room. So the first hurdle was being able to play and making sure that I could actually play with enough latency. The next hurdle will be making sure that I can stream, not necessarily while playing, but just stream anything like one of these. And then the next hurdle beyond that would be streaming while playing Dead by Daylight. So I wouldn't expect that for another week or two, let's say. 
I know I don't have anything else going on. I'm down here on vacation for the holidays, but uh, I, I don't actually slave over getting the setup just right for all of y'all the whole time. I actually do have a couple things I need to do from a work perspective. I owe somebody a, uh, their training agenda for January. Next up, Ickle Mouse says, Hi Brent, I'm pretty new to Azure as Evil Corp is moving everything up there from on-premises. I would appreciate a knowledge check. I cannot find a SQL DB solution that allows cross-region auto failover to take place. Did everything I see involves a manual step? Did I miss something? So this is the kind of the same as on-premises stuff. You don't really want to fail over automatically from one data center to another until you can also make sure that all of your applications are ready to fail over, app servers, web servers, whatever, and also that you're not going to lose data. Generally speaking, cross data center failovers involve data loss because generally speaking, you do asynchronous replica replication to your disaster recovery data center. You could, in theory, do synchronous writes to multiple data centers, and SQL Server always on availability groups certainly allows for that. But generally, what most people find is that their inserts, updates, and deletes are intolerably slow if you force a consensus write across multiple data centers. So uh, generally these days, most cloud providers uh, do automatic failover within the same data center, but I don't, I don't even know if people are allowing uh, synchronous writes across multiple data centers because the, uh, the insert update and lead performance is so bad that most people just won't tolerate it. If you needed something like that, I would probably look closer to either uh, Cosmos DB or Google Cloud Spanner. Both of those would require changes to your application, uh, but they have the capability to replicate worldwide and automatically fail over in the sense that you don't necessarily need to care where your primary lives. Uh, but yeah, that, that's why you're not finding it. And, and similarly, you'd hear the same thing with people with on-premises. Uh, what is a delicious Diet Coke, as far as you know? Uh, that why generally you don't see people doing it in on-premises SQL servers either because the overhead's just too high. And if you're coming from, you said, Evil Corp, you probably have dark fiber between multiple data centers, so you're allowed to do it or enabled to do it uh, in the cloud bandwidth. Just uh, even though it's more plentiful, it's not necessarily that low latent. Next up, San asks, Hi Brent, my database administrator has set the auto growth to one megabyte and 10%. And now this is of ha created the hundreds of fragments. What is the best approach to reduce these fragments? And do you advise defragmentation using contig, exe, or shrink databases? I am lost here. So given that you're asking the question at that level, that you're asking like about contig.exe, uh, I'm going to assume that you're very, very new at database administration, also because you said my DBA. Whoever your DBA was at setting those auto growth sizes, that was incorrect. You have identified that, fix that, just set auto growth to a good sane number based on your own uh, experience with those databases um, or based on our training classes. And then honestly, given your skill level, I would leave it at that. I wouldn't touch it any further. I am not being condescending. What I am going to say is, now is your chance to go watch. If you go over to YouTube, go watch our Fundamentals of Database Administration class. It's completely free, and it talks about things, how you administer SQL Server, how you set up auto growth, how you configure growth sizes, uh, how to solve fragmentation problems. It's all totally free. If you go to YouTube, go to the Brent Ozar Unlimited channel and look for Fundamentals of Database Administration. Now, so I say that because the level of questions that you're asking have some big red flags in there, like you should absolutely never do certain things. So I want to make sure you get a good fundamentals focus before you go trying to fix things like a large number of fragments, which are honestly probably not your biggest problem. 
I'm more worried in an environment like that about things like checking for corruption. Next up we have Jim Ignatowski. Jim says, I'm trying to investigate a, pr a stored procedure that uses cursors. Unfortunately, the execution of this stored procedure with, with actual plans enabled crashes Management Studio because there's too many plans generated, I guess. Is there a better tool to capture the query plans for procs that use cursors? Let's zoom out and just say that cursors aren't really a high performance way to accomplish a task. You have successfully identified that it uses a cursor. The better solution is to rewrite it using set-based operations. If that's not an option, because sometimes it isn't, if that's not an option, what you could do instead is you could use SP Blitz Cache. SP Blitz Cache looks at your plan cache to see what are the most resource intensive queries uh, that are associated with a particular stored procedure. I'm going to give you the really 101 level answer with this, which would be in a development environment, free your plan cache run the stored procedure that uses cursors, and then run SP Blitz cache, and it'll tell you the most recent resource intensive queries overall. If you Google for SP underscore Blitz cache, you will find uh, free videos on how to go about using it. So that's where I would start. Number one, rewrite it as set based if you can. If you can't do that, do it in a development environment, blow the plan cache, and run SP Blitz cache after you run the proc. Next, uh, uh, I use lowercase for select asks, Hi Brent, I hope you have decent Wi-Fi coverage there in Mexico. Woohoo! My customer is using mixed mode authentication for some, excuse me, some of its applications. When I'm Googling for best practices on that, I get inconsistent results. What is your stand on mixed mode versus uh, Windows only authentication and why? So back before the cloud, people started going, the best practice is to use Windows authentication because then from a central place you can disable uh, logins uh, for one specific login and it works across all your SQL servers instantly. You can do all kinds of you know, GPO type stuff. And then as Microsoft introduced Azure SQL DB, Windows authentication wasn't supported at the time. So best practices swung around the other way where Microsoft couldn't say, hey, you should only use SQL authentication because it simply wasn't available in the cloud. So then best practices stopped talking about that for a while. Then Azure SQL DB started supporting uh, Windows authentication. And you can guess what's happening now with the best practices documentation starting to swing over back towards Windows. Me personally, what do we got? To, oh, somebody in a little ultralight there. Me personally, I don't really care whether you use mixed mode, mode authentication or Windows authentication. To me, the bigger problem is how you secure those credentials. Because I've seen people do a really crappy job of securing Windows credentials about checking in the password in their source code, for example. So I, I don't think that the, the mode of authentication is really the silver bullet that a lot of folks make it out to be. Uh, let's see here. Last up, we'll take one from Default DBA. Default DBA says, Hey Brent, I'm really enjoying your office hours and your recorded season pass training. Oh, good to hear it. My question is about integers versus GUIDs for key fields. We have systems that use both, and I'm wondering if there are reasons to use one over the other. There are, and because you have my recorded class season pass, Go to the Mastering Index Tuning class, and in Mastering Index Tuning, there is a module on heaps and clustered indexes, and we spend about eh, 45 minutes or so digging into the differences between heaps, clustered in indexes on integers, clustered indexes on GUIDs, and other kinds of columns. And I lay out the differences inside there. I explain my sunny principles, which are kind of nice here that it's actually sunny. I explain my sunny principles, which is how you evaluate whether you should use integers or GUIDs. 
So speaking of sunny, there's, oh, there are a couple of people uh, playing with snorkeling in the pool. That's probably a good idea for practicing. I haven't snorkeled in quite a while and I should work on that. Uh, so it's time for me to get out there and go get sunburned out in this uh, beautiful Mexican sun. I should probably finish my tasty Diet Coke first. Mm. And then I'm really looking forward to showing y'all uh, office hours at sunrise, uh, watching the whales jump. You know, you can see from out here the, the uh, whales come down this time of year. I was sitting out on the balcony yesterday, posted a picture to my Instagram story with the whales jumping up and breaching out of the water. Uh, and uh, uh, the baby turtles are hatching on the beach too, so I get to come down and watch or go down in the mornings and make sure that each of them make it down to the uh, water safely. So I will see y'all at the next office hours. Adios.